Story twenty one of Abaft the Funnel by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twenty one Letters on Leave. One to Lieutenant John McHale, 151st Comhershan, P.N.I., Hakati via Taranda, Assam. Dear old man, your handwriting is worse than ever, but as far as I can see among the loops and fish-hooks you are lonesome and want to be comforted with a letter. I knew you wouldn't write to me unless you needed something. You don't tell me that you have left your regiment, but from what you say about my battalion, my men, and so forth, it seems as if you were raising military police for the benefit of the chins. If that's the case, I congratulate you. The pay is good. Ulus writes to me from some new fort something or other, saying that he has struggled into a billet of R.S. 700 military police and instead of being chased by ritters, as he used to be, is ravaging the country round Shillong in search of a wife. I am very sorry for the Mrs. Ulis of the future. That doesn't matter. You probably know more about the boys yonder than I do. If you'll only send me, from time to time, some records of their movements, I'll try to tell you of things on this side of the water. You say you don't know what it is to hear from town. I say you don't know what it is to hear from the Dahat. Now and again men drift in with news, but I don't like hot-weather cubber. It's all of the domestic occurrence kind. Old Hat Constable came to see me the other day. You remember the click in his throat before he begins to speak? He sat still, clicking at quarter-hour intervals, and after each click he'd say, Do you remember Mistress So-and-so? Well, she's dead a typhoid at Naogong. When it wasn't Mistress So-and-so, it was a man. I stood four clicks and four deaths, and then I asked him to spare me the rest. You seem to have had a bad season, taking it all round, and the women seem to have suffered most. Is that so? We don't die in London. We go out of town, and we make as much fuss about it as if we were going to the Neva. Now I understand why the transport is the first thing to break down when our army takes the field. The Englishman is cumbrous in his movements, and very particular about his baskets and hampers and trunks, not less than seven of each, for a fifty-mile journey. Leave season began some weeks ago, and there is a burra-choop along the streets that you could shovel with a spade. All the people that say they are everybody have gone quite two hundred miles away. Some of them are even on the continent, and the clubs are full of strange folk. I found a reform man at the Savage a week ago. He didn't say what his business was, but he was dusty and looked hungry. I suppose he had come in for food and shelter. Like the rest, I'm on leave, too. I converted myself into a government secretary, awarded myself one month on full pay, with the chance of an extension, and went off. Then it rained and hailed and rained again, and I ran up and down this tiny country in trains trying to find a dry place. After ten days I came back to town, having been stopped by the sea four times. I was rather like a kitten at the bottom of a bucket chasing its own tail. So I'm sitting here under a grey, muggy sky, wondering what sort of time they are having at Simla. It's August now, the rains would be nearly over, all the theatricals would be in full swing, and Jacko Hill would be just paradise. You're probably pink with prickly heat. Sit down quietly under the punkah and think of Umbala Station, hot as an oven at four in the morning. Think of the Dakgarry slobbering in the wet, and the first little cold wind that comes round the first corner after the Tonga is clear of Kalka. There's a wind you and I know well. It's blowing over the grass at Dutsai this very moment, and there's a smell of hot fir trees all along and along from Salon to Simla, and some happy man is flying up that road with fragments of a Tonga bar in his eye, his pet terrier under his arm, his thick clothes on the back seat, 
and the certainty of a month's pure joy in front of him. Instead of which, you're being stewed at Hakati, and I'm sitting in a second-hand atmosphere above a sausage shop, watching three sparrows playing in a dirty green tree and pretending that it's summer. I have a view of very many streets and a river. Except the advertisements on the walls, there isn't one speck of color as far as my eye can reach. The very cat, who is an amiable beast, comes off black under my hand, and I daren't open the window for fear of smuts. And this is better than a soaked and sobbled country, with the corn shocks standing like plover's eggs in green moss, and the oats lying flat in moist lumps. We haven't had any summer, and yesterday I smelt the raw touch of the winter. Just one little whiff to show that the year had turned. Oh, what a happy land is England! I cannot understand the white man at home. You remember when we went out together and landed at the Apollo Bunder with all our sorrows before us, and went to Watson's hotel and saw the snake charmers? You said, it'll take me all my lifetime to distinguish one nigger from another. That was eight years ago. Now you don't call them niggers any more, and you're supposed, quite wrongly, to have an insight into native character, or else you would never have been allowed to recruit for the Kumharsans. I feel as I felt at Watson's. They are so deathly alike, especially the more educated. They all seem to read the same books, and the same newspapers, telling them what to admire in the same books, and they all quote the same passages from the same books, and they write books on books about somebody else's books, and they are penetrated to their boot-heels with a sense of the awful seriousness of their own views of the moment. Above that, they seem to be, most curiously and beyond the right of ordinary people, divorced from the knowledge or fear of death. Of course, every man conceives that every man except himself is bound to die. You remember how Hallett spoke the night before he went out. But these men appear to be like children in that respect. I can't explain exactly, but it gives an air of unreality to their most earnest earnestness. And when a young man of views and culture and aspirations is in earnest, the trumpets of Jericho are silent beside him. Because they have everything done for them, they know how everything ought to be done, and they are perfectly certain that wood pavements, policemen, shops, and gaslight come in the regular course of nature. You can guess with these convictions how thoroughly and cocksurely they handle little trifles like colonial administration, the wants of the army, municipal sewage, housing of the poor, and so forth. Every third common need of average men is, in their mouths, a tendency, or a movement, or a federation affecting the world. It never seems to occur to them that the human instinct of getting as much as possible for money paid, or failing money for threats and fawnings, is about as old as Cain, and the burden of their bat is, me and a few mates of mine are going to make a new world. As long as men only write and talk, they must think that way, I suppose. It's compensation for playing with little things. And that reminds me, do you know the university smile? You don't by that name, but sometimes young civilians wear it for a very short time when they first come out. Something, I wonder if it's our brutal chaff or a billiard cue or which, takes it out of their faces, and when they next differ with you, they do so without smiling. But that smile flourishes in London. I've met it again and again. It expresses tempered grief, sorrow at your complete inability to march with the march of progress at the universities, and a chastened contempt. There is one man who wears it as a garment. He is frivolously young, not more than thirty-five or forty, and all these years no one has removed that smile. He knows everything about everything on this earth, and above all he knows all about men under any and every condition of life. He knows all about the aggressive militarism of you and your friends. He isn't quite sure of the necessity of an army. 
he is certain that colonial expansion is nonsense, and he is more than certain that the whole step of all our empire must be regulated by the knowledge and foresight of the working man. Then he smiles, smiles like a seraph with an M.A. degree. What can you do with a man like that? He has never seen an unmade road in his life. I think he believes that wheat grows on a tree and that beef is dug from a mine. He has never been forty miles from a railway, and he has never been called upon to issue an order to anybody except his well-fed servants. Isn't it wondrous? And there are battalions and brigades of these men in town, removed from the fear of want, living until they are seventy or eighty, sheltered, fed, drained, and administered, expending their vast leisure in talking and writing. But the real fun begins much lower down the line. I've been associating generally, and very particularly, with the men who say that they are the only men in the world who work, and they call themselves the working man. Now, the working man in America is a nice person. He says he is a man and behaves accordingly. That is to say, he has some notion that he is part and parcel of a great country. At least he talks that way. But in this town you can see thousands of men meeting publicly on Sundays to cry aloud that everybody may hear that they are poor downtrodden helots, in fact the poor working man. At their clubs and pubs the talk is the same. It's the utter want of self-respect that revolts. My friend the tobacconist has a cousin who is, apparently, sound in mind and limb, aged twenty-three, clear-eyed and upstanding. He is a skibbo by trade, a painter of sorts. He married at twenty, and he has two children. He can spend three-quarters of an hour talking about his downtrodden condition. He works under another Raj Mistri, who has saved money and started a little shop of his own. He hates that Raj Mistri, he loathes the police, and his views on the lives and customs of the aristocracy are strange. He approves of every form of lawlessness, and he knows that everybody who holds authority is sure to be making a good thing out of it. Of himself as a citizen he never thinks. Of himself as an Ishmael he thinks a good deal. He is entitled to eight hours' work a day and some time off, said time to be paid for. He is entitled to free education for his children, and he doesn't want no bloomin' clergyman to teach him. He is entitled to houses, especially built for himself, because he pays the bulk of the taxes of the country. He is not going to emigrate, not he. He reserves to himself the right of multiplying as much as he pleases. The streets must be policed for him while he demonstrates, immediately under my window, by the way, for ten consecutive hours, and I am probably a thief because my clothes are better than his. The proposition is a very simple one. He has no duties to the state, no personal responsibility of any kind, and he'd sooner see his children dead than soldiers of the Queen. The government owes him everything because he is a poor working man. When the guards tried their board-school mutiny at the Wellington barracks, my friend was jubilant. "'What did I tell you?' he said. "'You see, the very soldiers won't stand it. What's it? Being treated like machines instead of flesh and blood? Of course they won't.' The popular evening paper wrote that the guards, with perfect justice, had rebelled against being treated like machines instead of flesh and blood. Then I thought of a certain regiment that lay in Myanmar for three years and dropped four hundred men out of a thousand. It died of fever and cholera. There were no pretty nursemaids to work with it in the streets, because there were no streets. I saw how the guards amused themselves, and how their sergeants smoked in uniform. I pitied the guards with their cruel sentry-goes, their three nights out of bed, and their unlimited supply of love and liquor. Another man, not a working man, told me that the guards' riot—it's impossible, as you know, to call this 
kick-up of the fatted flunkies of the army a mutiny, was only a schoolboy's prank, and he could not see that if it was what he said it was, the guards were no regiment and should have been wiped out decently and quietly. There again the futility of a sheltered people cropped up. You mustn't treat a man like a machine in this country, but you can't get any work out of a man till he has learned to work like a machine. Blank has just come home for a few months from the charge of a mountain battery on the frontier. He used to begin work at eight, and he was thankful if he got off at six, most of the time on his feet. When he went to the Black Mountains, he was extensively engaged for nearly sixteen hours a day, and that on food at which the poor workingman would have turned up his state-lifted nose. Blank on the subject of labor, as understood by the white man in his own home, is worth hearing. Though coarse, considerably coarse. But Blank doesn't know all the hopeless misery of the business. When the small pig, oyster, furniture, carpet, builder, or general shopman, works his way out of the ruck, he turns round and makes his old friends and employees sweat. He knows how near he can go to flaying them alive before they kick, and in this matter he is neither better nor worse than a bonilla or a haveldar of our own blessed country. It's the small employer of labor that skins his servant, exactly as the forty-pound householder works her one white servant to the bone and goes to drop pennies into the plate to convert the heathen in the East. Just at present, as you have read, the person who calls himself the poor working man, the man I saw kicking fallen men in the mud by the docks last winter, has discovered a real, fine, new, original notion, and he is working it for all he is worth. He calls it the solidarity of labor bundobast, but it's caste, four thousand years old, caste of Minu, with old shets, mahardens, guild tolls, excommunication, and all the rest of it. All things considered, there isn't anything much older than caste. It began with the second generation of man on earth. But to read the advanced papers on the subject, you'd imagine it was a revelation from heaven. The real fun will begin, as it has begun and ended many times before, when the caste of skilled labor, that's the poor working man, are pushed up and knocked about by the lower and unrecognized castes, who will form castes of their own, and outcasts on the decision of their own punchayats. How these castes will scuffle and fight among themselves, and how astonished the Englishman will be! He is naturally lawless because he is a fighting animal, and his amazingly sheltered condition has made him inconsequent. I don't like inconsequent lawlessness. I've seen it down at Bow Street, at the docks by the GPO, and elsewhere. Its chief home, of course, is in that queer place called the House of Commons, but no one goes there who isn't forced by business. It's shut up at present, and the persons who belong to it are loose all over the face of the country. I don't think, but I won't swear, that any of them are spitting at policemen. One man appears to have been poaching, others are advocating various forms of murder and outrage, and nobody seems to care. The residue talk just heavens how they talk and what wonderful fictions they tell and they firmly believe being ignorant of the mechanism of government that they administer the country in addition certain of their newspapers have elaborately worked up a famine in ireland that could be engineered by two deputy commissioners and four average stunts into a woe and a calamity that is going to overshadow the peace of the nation even the empire. I suppose they have their own sense of proportion, but they manage to keep it to themselves very successfully. What do you, who have seen half a countryside in deadly fear of its life, suppose that this people would do if they were chuckered and gabarrowed, if they really knew what the fear of death and the dread of injury implied, if they died very swiftly indeed, 
and could not count their futile lives enduring beyond next sundown. Some of the men from your, I mean our, part of the world say that they would be afraid and break and scatter and run. But there is no room in the island to run. The sea catches you mid-waist at the third step. I am curious to see if the cholera, of which these people stand in most lively dread, gets a firm foothold in London. In that case I have a notion that there will be scenes and panics. They live too well here, and have too much to make life worth clinging to. Clubs and shop fronts and gas and theatres and so forth, things that they affect to despise, and whereon and whereby they live like leeches. But I have written enough. It doesn't exhaust the subject, but you won't be grateful for other epistles. De Vitra of the Puna Irregular Moguls will have it that they are a tiddy iddy people. He says that all their visible use is to produce loans for the colonies and men to be used up in developing India. I honestly believe that the average Englishman would faint if you told him it was lawful to use up human life for any purpose whatever. He believes that it has to be developed and made beautiful for the possessor, and in that belief talkatively perpetrates cruelties that would make Torquemada jump in his grave. Go to Alipur if you want to see. I am off to foreign parts, forty miles away, to catch fish for my friend the Sharket, also to shoot a little bird if I have luck. Yours, Rudyard Kipling. 2. To Captain J. McHale, 151st Kumarsan, N.I., Hakati via Taranda. Captain Sahib Bahadur, the last pie gives me news of your step, and I'm more pleased about it than many. You've been cavalry quick in your promotion. Eight years and your company. Allahu! But it must have been that long, lean horsehead of yours that looks so wise and says so little that has imposed upon the authorities. My best congratulations. Let out your belt two holes and be happy, as I am not. Did I tell you in my last about going to Woking in search of a grave? The dust and the grime and the grey and the sausage shop told on my spirits to such an extent that I solemnly took a train and went grave-hunting through the necropolis, locally called the necropolis. I wanted an eligible, entirely detached site in a commanding position, six by three and bricked throughout. I found it, but the only drawback was that I must go back to town to the head office to buy it. One doesn't go to town to haggle for tomb space, so I deferred the matter and went fishing. All the same, there are very nice graves at Woking, and I shall keep my eye on one of them. Since that date I seem to have been in four or five places, because there are labels on the bag. One of the places was Plymouth, where I found half a regiment at field exercises on the hoe. They were practicing the attack in three lines with the mixed rush at the end, even as it is laid down in the drill-book, and they charged subduedly across the hoe. The people laughed. I was much more inclined to cry. Except the major, there didn't seem to be anything more than twenty years old in the regiment. And, oh, but it was pink and white and chubby and undersized, just made to die succulently of disease. I fancied that some of our battalions out with you were more or less young and exposed, but a home battalion is a creche, and it scares one to watch it. Eminent and distinguished generals get up after dinner. I've listened to two of them, and explain that though the home battalion can only be regarded as a feeder to the foreign, yet all our battalions can be regarded as efficient, and if they aren't efficient we shall find in our military reserve the nucleus, how I loathe that lying word, of the Lord knows what, but the speeches always end with allusions to the spirit of the English, their glorious past, and the certainty that when the hour of need comes, the nation will emerge victorious, if sick 
the engineer of the Hungerford Bridge, told the Southeastern Railway that because a main girder had stood for thirty years without need of renewal, it was therefore sure to stand for another fifty, he would probably get the sack. Our military authorities don't get the sack. They are allowed to make speeches in public. Some day, if we live long enough, we shall see the glories of the past and the sublime instinct of an ancient people without one complete army corps pitted against a few unsentimental long-range guns and some efficiently organized troops. Then the band will begin to play, and it will not play Rule Britannia until it has played some funny tunes first. Do you remember Tig? He was in the Deccan Lancers and retired because he got married. He is in Ireland now, and I met him the other day, idle, unhappy, and dying for some work to do. Mrs. Tig is equally miserable. She wants to go back to Pune instead of administering a big barrack of a house somewhere at the back of a fog. I quote Tig here. He has, you may remember, a pretty tongue about him, and he was describing to me at length how a home regiment behaves when it is solemnly turned out for a week or a month's training under canvas. Quote, About four in the morning, me dear boy, they began pitching their tents for the next day, four hours to pitch it, and the tent ropes a-howl and tangle when all said and sworn. Then they tie their horses with strings to their big toes and go to bed in hollows and caves in the earth till the rain falls and the tents are flooded, and then, me dear boy, the men and the horses and the ropes and the vegetation of the country cuddle each other till the morning for company's sake. The next day it all begins again. Just when they are beginning to understand how to camp, they are all put back into their boxes and half of them have lung disease." Unquote. But what is the use of snarling and grumbling? The matter will adjust itself later on, and the one nation on earth that talks and thinks most of the sanctity of human life will be a little astonished at the waste of life for which it will be responsible. In those days, my captain, the man who can command seasoned troops and have made the best use of those troops will be sought after and petted and will rise to honor. Remember the Haketi when next you measure the naked recruit. Let us revisit calmer scenes. I've been down for three perfect days to the seaside. Don't you remember what a really fine day means? A milk-white sea as smooth as glass, with blue-white heat haze hanging over it, one little wave talking to itself on the sand, warm shingle, four bathing machines, cliff in the background, and half the babies in Christendom paddling and yelling. It was a queer little place, just near enough to the main line of traffic to be overlooked from morning till night. There was a baby, an Ollendorfian baby, with whom I fell madly in love. She lived down at the bottom of a great white sunbonnet, talked French and English in a clear, bell-like voice, and of such I fervently hope will the kingdom of heaven be. When she found that my French wasn't equal to hers, she condescendingly talked English, and bade me build her houses of stones, and draw cats for her through half the day. After I had done everything that she ordered, she went off to talk to someone else. The beach belonged to that baby, and every soul on it was her servant, for I know that we rose with shouts when she paddled into three inches of water, and sat down gasping, Mon Dieu, je suis mort! I know you like the little ones, so I don't apologize for yarning about them. She had a sister aged seven and one-half, a lovely child without a scrap of self-consciousness and enormous eyes. Here comes a real tragedy. The girl, and her name was Violet, had fallen wildly in love with a little fellow of nine. They used to walk up the single street of the village with their arms around each other's necks. Naturally, she did all the little wooings, and Hugh submitted quietly. Then devotion began to Paul, and he didn't care to paddle with Violet. Hereupon, as far as I can gather, she smote him on the head and threw him against a wall. Anyhow, it was very sweet and natural, and Hugh told me about it when I came down. 
She's so unrulable, he said. I didn't hit her back, but I was very angry. Of course, Violet repented, but Hugh grew suspicious, and at the psychological moment there came down from town a destroyer of delights and a separator of companions in the shape of a tricycle. Also, there were many little boys on the beach, rude, shouting, romping little chaps, who said, Come along, hello, and used the wicked word, beastly. Among these, Hugh became a person of importance, and began to realize that he was a man who could say beastly and come on with the best of them. He preferred to run about with the little boys on wars of expedition, and he wriggled away when Violet put her arm around his waist. Violet was hurt and angry, and I think she slapped Hugh. Relations were strained when I arrived, because one morning Violet, after asking permission, invited Hugh to come to lunch, and that bad, Spanish-eyed boy deliberately filled his bucket with the cold sea-water and dashed it over Violet's pink ankles. Joking apart, this seems to be about the best way of refusing an invitation that civilization can invent. Try it on your colonel. She was madly angry for a moment, and then she said, Let me carry you up the beach, cause of the shingles in your toes. This was divine, but it didn't move Hugh, and Violet went off to her mother. She sat down with her chin in her hand, looking out at the sea for a long time, very sorrowfully. Then she said, and it was her first experience, I know that Hugh cares more for his horrid bicycle than he does for me, and if he said he didn't, I wouldn't believe him. Up to date, Hugh has said nothing. He is running about, playing with the bold, bad little boys, and Violet is sitting on a breakwater, trying to find out why things are as they are. It's a nice tale, and tales are scarce these days. Have you noticed how small and elemental is the stock of them at the world's disposal? Men foregathered at that little seaside place, and manlike exchanged stories. They were all the same stories. One had heard them in the East with Eastern variations, and in the West with Western extravagances tacked on. Only one thing seemed new, and it was merely a phrase used by a groom in speaking of an ill-conditioned horse. No, sir, he's not ill in a matter of speaking, but he's so to speak generally unfriendly with his innards as a usual thing. I entrust this to you as a sacred gift. See that it takes root in the land. Unfriendly with his innards as a usual thing. Remember, it's better than labored explanation in the rains, and I fancy it's raw. And now, but I had nearly forgotten, we're a nation of grumblers, and that's why other people call Anglo-Indians bores. I write feelingly because blank, just home on long leave, has for the second time sat on my devoted head for two hours simply and solely for the purpose of swearing at the accountant general. He has given me the whole history of his pay, prospects, and promotion twice over, and in case I should misunderstand, wants me to dine with him and hear it all for the third time. If Blank would leave the A.G. alone, he is a delightful man, as we all know. But he's loose in London now, buttonholing English friends and quoting leave and pay codes to them. He wants to see a member of Parliament about something or other, and I believe he spends his nights rolled up in a rese on the stairs of the India office waiting to catch a secretary. I like the Indian office. They are so beautifully casual and lazy, and their rooms look out over the green park, and they are never tired of admiring the view. Now and then a man comes in to report himself, and the secretaries and the undersecretaries and the chirprassies play battledore and shuttlecock with him until they are tired. Some time since, when I was better, more serious and earnest than I am now, I preached a jihad up and down those echoing corridors, 
and suggested the abolition of the India office and the purchase of a four-pound ten American revolving bookcase to hold all the documents on India that were of public value or could be comprehended by the public. Now I am more frivolous, because I am dropping gently into the grave at Woking, and yet I believe in the bookcase. India is bowed down with too much duftar as it is, and the house of correction, revision, division, and supervision cannot do her much good. I saw a committee, or a council, file in the other day. Only one desirable tale came to me out of that office. If you've heard it before, stop me. It began with a cutting from an obscure Welsh paper, I think. A man, a gardener, went mad, announced that Lord Cross was the Messiah, and burned himself alive on a pile of garden refuse. That's the first part. I never could get at the second, but I am credibly informed that the work of the India office stood still for three weeks while the entire staff took counsel how to break the news to the Secretary of State. I believe it still remains unbroken. Decidedly, leave in England is a disappointing thing. I've wandered into two stations since I wrote the last. Nothing but the labels on the bag remain. Oh, and a memory of a weighing in at an East End fishing club. That was an experience. I foregathered with a man on the top of a bus, and we became great friends because we both agreed that gorge tackle for pike was only permissible in very weedy streams. He repeated his views, which were my views, nearly ten times, and in the evening invited me to this weighing in at, we'll say, rooms of the Lee and Chertsey Piscatorial Anglers Benevolent Brotherhood. We assembled in a room at the top of a public house, the walls ornamented with stuffed fish and water birds, and the anglers came in by twos and threes, and I was introduced to all of them as the gentleman I met just now. This seemed to be good enough for all practical purposes. There were ten and five shilling prizes, and the affable and energetic clerk of the scales behaved as though he were weighing in for the Lucknow races. The take of the day was one pound fifteen ounces of dace and roach, about twenty fingerlings, and the winner, who is in charge of a railway bookstall, described minutely how he caught each fish. As a matter of fact, roach fishing in the Lee and Thames is a fine art. Then there were drinks, modest little drinks, and they called upon me for a sentiment. You know how things go at the sergeant's messes and some of the lodges. In a moment of brilliant inspiration, I gave free fishing in the parks, and brought down the whole house. Psa! Free fishing for coarse fish in the serpentine and the green park water would hurt nobody and do a great deal of good to many. The stocking of the water. But what does this interest you? The Englishman moves slowly. He is just beginning to understand that it is not sufficient to set apart a certain amount of land for a lung of London and to turn people into it with, There, get along and play, unless he gives them something to play with. Thirty years hence he will almost allow cafés and hired bands in Hyde Park. To return for a moment to the fish club, I got away at eleven, and in darkness and despair had to make my way west for leagues and leagues across London. I was on the Mile End Road at midnight, and there lost myself, and learned something more about the policeman. He is haughty in the east, and always afraid that he is being chaffed. I honestly only wanted sailing directions to get homeward. One policeman said, Get along, you know your way as well as I do. And yet another, you go back to the country where you comed from, you ain't doing no good ear. It was so deadly true that I couldn't answer back, and there wasn't an expensive cab handy to prove my virtue and respectability. Next time I visit the Lee and Chertsey affabilities, I'll find out something about trains. Meantime, I keep holiday dolefully. There is not anybody to play with me. They have all gone away to their own places. 
Even the infant, who is generally the idlest man in the world, writes me that he is helping to steer a ten-ton yacht in Scottish seas. When she heels over too much, the infant is driven to the O.P. side, and she writes herself. The infant's host says, Isn't this bracing? Isn't this delightful? And the infant, who lives in dread of a chill bringing back his Indian fever, has to say, e Yes, and pretend to despise overcoats. Voila! This is a cheerful world. Rudyard Kipling <laughs> 